Hi folks, let's machine these wheel hubs for the Mars Curiosity rover. This project was really difficult. There's work holding, there's turning, there's moving the part between setups, and there's milling. And when I first saw this part, to quote it, I thought, okay, doesn't look too bad. And then I realized it's actually really pretty small, which means we've got to get some small tooling in there and get our feeds and speeds and tool run out dialed in. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So if you want to learn and take something away from this video, pause right now, kind of look at this part and think about how you would fixture. What's the workflow? That's the tricky part. Here's what we decided to do. First operation is going to be to take our piece of raw material, deck it, and get the hex machined inside of it. To do that, we've got a regular old three jaw lathe chuck on our mill, it's clamped down, makes it really easy to get good work holding here. Also to do a small batch of these, six in this case, and sometimes it's nice to not have to cut custom shaped or sized soft jaws. The hex that we're machining here will face the internal shaft, so you won't see it. And we're using Mickey Mouse corners so that it fits over that hex shaft. If it was an aesthetic part or externally facing part, you could pull those Mickey Mouse corners in a little bit tighter so they don't look as pronounced. With the hex in there, we're now gonna flip it over. We've got a hole that we can use to set our work coordinate system, or rather check it in the three jaw. Next, we're going to do an adaptive and a 2D contour to finish this counterbore on the front side of the part. That's gonna let us use that counterbore later with a calf screw for fixturing. That way we don't have to worry about sticking a tool back in that pocket. Over to the Slant Pro four jaw chuck that's going to let us dial in this piece of material. With it chucked up, we're going to turn the back side. So it's a combination of facing off that backside, but then really roughing out that material, as well as putting that final turned radius on the inside of the hubs. All right, folks, see that bird's nesting? I'm not happy about it. Stick around here, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Now we can make use of that hex pattern with a custom hex fixture, slide our workpiece on there, use the cap screw, and then dial in both the radius and the face of our part. All right, folks, see those birds' nests? Time out. Let's look at cutting aluminum the right way. Same insert. Here we're running the right speeds and feeds to break that chip to run a better operation and a safer operation. To 432 insert, we're running at 1,000 surface feet per minute, 12 thou feet per rev, and 60 thou depth of cut, or maximum roughing step down. 
So what happened here? It was a new fixture, a new work holding setup. We were taking it easy. Unfortunately, that's the trade-off. When you reduce your feed per rev or you reduce your depth of cut, you aren't activating that chip breaker. So what's the solution? Next time we need to use a different insert, one that has a smaller nose radius that will break those chips with lighter depths of cut. Back over to the mill using that same fixture that's gonna let us dial it in and repeat the batch of six of these. And while we've got a lot of the material left to remove and some details of machine in here, really this is coming down home stretch. Back into my comfort world of 2D adaptives as well as some 2D contours to clean up. A little pro tip, if you're doing those contours for finishing passes, whether it's the same tool or a different tool, under passes, check stock to leave and leave a thousandth or even half a thousandth of axial stock to leave. What that'll do is if you've got ever so slight of a mismeasurement of your tool height, and it's very easy to mismeasure tool height by half a thousandth of an inch. You won't have that tool mark walking along the inside of the 2D contour. Stepping down with some pretty small tools, again, making use of the 10K spindle, half a thousandth feet per tooth because we're effectively sliding here, but taking it easy, don't think we broke a single tool making all of these, but the key is you do wanna check your tool run out. Card here to the bazooka Lego mold that we make where we show more of that process. And last but not least, making use of the fourth axis, setting this up again on that same mandrel, and this is gonna let us dial in one of those stems and then spot, drill, and tap the six periphery holes that are how the wheel fastens onto this hub. And if you're watching this and you're thinking, oh my gosh, get a live tooled lathe, we hear you. <laughs> Running these in production, a live tooled lathe would be totally uh, the way to go, but we don't have one and would you set up every tool for live tool lathe? I think the answer is probably yes, but um, we have some friends that have live tool lathes and you don't always have enough axial or radial holders or tool positions. Uh, they're quite they're quite expensive. And there's some setup time to it. Uh, don't get me wrong, we'd love to have one, but uh, I'd be curious to see how you guys would do a part like this. Again, only running a batch of six. If you had a live tool lathe, it's probably worth setting it up, but I'd be curious to see the uh, opinions of folks that actually have those machines and run them and set them up. Or were we missing some obvious way to cut out a step or two from these? Regardless, they turned out great. We love working on this. It's gotta be one of the coolest projects, not only because it's a Mars Curiosity Rover replica, but also because it's headed to a museum, which is really cool. Hope you enjoy, take care, see you soon. <laughs>